Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining. The webinar will start shortly. Good morning all. We're just waiting for a few more people to join before starting. Hello everyone and thank you for joining the next in our series of Wednesday webinars. My name is Kath Crowther, I'm the Regional Director for the East and your Chair for today. We're very aware of the impact that coronavirus is having on you and your businesses. Um, there have been far-reaching consequences of the government lockdown and now we're having to decipher the new advice as restrictions are lifted gradually. Before I introduce our speakers, please can I remind you that there's a wealth of information available on the COVID pages of the CLA website. There's also a range of member only guidance notes covering topics from public access to furloughing workers to residential tenancies. These are constantly updated um, and added to as and when um, required. And um, members also access free advice um, please, please get in touch with your regional office if there's anything we can do to help you. That is what we're here for. Um, these inquiries also help feed into the meetings that we're having with government departments and help us establish a lobbying position on different matters. Now, whilst COVID has taken up a huge amount of our time over the last weeks or months now, 
We've be, also been working hard on a range of other topics um, as per usual. The Agriculture Bill is back in Parliament today for the report stage. We've been lobbying MPs on this and we'll keep members informed of progress. Now to move to today's topic, the amount of regulation relating to residential property seems to be ever increasing. Um, hopefully you'll find today a useful session running through some of the long list of landlords legal responsibilities. Thank you to Stratton Parker and Barclays, both of whom will be speaking to you today. Just to remind you that today's session is being recorded for future use, including um, the availability to other members. The, this will be available on the webinar pages of the CLA website later today or tomorrow. The format of the event is that our speakers will present. Please feel free to ask questions at any time using the Q&A button. Please restrict your questions to the subject matter, otherwise approach your CLA regional office for advice in the normal man manner. Harry Flanagan will start. He, she will give an update from the CLA legal team and run through some of the key points to remember when granting an assured for short term tenancy. I'll hand over to Harry. Just when Harry is sorting out his, um, I'll just run through the rest of the lineup. Um, following Harry, Hermione Warmington, who's a housing advisor in the CLA London team, will give an update on electrical safety and energy efficiency and these. Um, following that, Jessa Waddington from Stress and Parker will talk through the Tenants Fees Act. Um, Alison Provis, the CLA Regional Advisor at least will then give an update on residential lettings and COVID-19. And finally, Carl McConville from Barclays will give a banker's view. Hopefully, Harry is now there. I think that if we're having technical problems with Harry, then perhaps we are best. Oh, sorry. There you go. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can. I hope you can hear me now. Sorry, there was an issue with my my buttons this end. Good morning. Hopefully you can now see me and um, thank you very much for joining us. I would say lovely to see you, but sadly I can't, which I have to say does feel a bit strange. I'm sure I will have had the pleasure of advising quite a few of you over the years. For others, I'm conscious that you will be currently adjusting to the fact that I'm not actually a man. I've always been Harry to everyone. As you will have seen, I'm a solicitor and I've had the joy of working for the CLA legal department on and off since 1998, when I first came here on secondment from private practice. Obviously I was 12. During this stint, I've advised on many different areas of the law, but for the last decade or so, I've concentrated solely on residential tenancies, arguably a bit of a short straw 
not only because the law is very complicated in this area, but as you will know, it never ever seems to stop changing. If as a landlord, you are feeling a bit exhausted by it all, you have my every sympathy. My main aim today is to let you know how we are here to help you. Firstly, of course, we help with advising on the law. I trust you all know that you are entitled to free legal advice. How amazing is that? A lawyer who won't charge you anything. Just to clarify, it is just advice. We can't sadly act for you. And helping with your legal inquiries is my favorite part of the job. As I'm sure you can imagine, no two days are ever the same, but this slide sum, sums up the general range of the advice I give. I'm often helping members to work out what rights an occupier actually has to be in a property. You know the deal, you can imagine. Your grandfather used to employ the current tenant's father, who has also worked for your family too for a bit, until he fell out with his wife and ran off with a local barmaid. Now you can't find him and you want to know what rights the wife has to stay in the property as you would like it back for a new stockman. It was the good old days, so there was nothing in writing and there were rumours of deathbed promises. What's the answer? Well, inevitably it involves a heady mix of common law, contract law and statutory interpretation. That's what I mean when I say untangling the loose ends and it's great fun. Of course, I also regularly advise on the best way to set up new agreements, whether that's for an employee, a friend, or a standard residential letting. I have a host of standard agreements that I can access for you, including an assured shorthold tenancy, various licenses, including a service occupancy agreement, and my personal favorite, not one that you're gonna find on the high street, is the agreement to formalise a statutory tenancy under the Rent Agriculture Act 1976. If you only remember one thing from me, please, please don't put anyone in a property without taking professional advice first. As, as Kath has said, there are just so many regulations covering this area now, you will get into hot water. So that is advice. Um, just going back to that one, um, that's setting up agreements. Of course, I am busy helping members understand who has to do what in any given tenancy situation, whether it's repairs, allowing access, servicing, serving notices. Um, and of course, very importantly, how best to regain possession of your properties when the time comes. That's the advice side. Secondly, we try to keep you up to date with key legal developments. Not an easy task in this area of the law and I do just want to underline um, guidance notes. These are the main way we communicate new legal obligations and the giving of technical advice. The latest one went live on the, on the CLA website yesterday and you'll hear more about that later. They should also get a mention in weekly news, in the email that comes out to you all. So do please keep an eye out for those. And of course, the articles we write for the website and the CLA magazine. Here is just a selection of some of the recent guidance notes over the past year or so that give you advice on the latest developments. Sadly, I haven't got time to go into these, but there will be more on some of them later in the seminar. One I do just want to highlight is this one, guidance note 2219. I would love this to be your starting point when you're considering setting up a new tenancy. It's my checklist of key points to remember when granting an AST. Again, sadly, I don't have time to expand on it too much, but I hope you will all feel inspired and encouraged to 
to download it. It includes the reminder, of course, that you must take certain steps if you're planning to house an agricultural worker, if you want to avoid the security of tenure that would otherwise arise. It also sets out all the pre-tenancy obligations that if you don't get right, you won't be able to use the section 21 to repossess your property. They're set out in the slide, so I won't go into them now, just to flag the gas safety certificate. Following a recent court case, it was held that the landlord who had failed to serve the gas safety certificate on the tenant before he went into occupation was then barred from using a section 21 notice and it was not something that could be cured by late service of the certificate. The note contains other invaluable reminders. So that is advising on the law, trying to keep you up to date with the developments and thirdly, of course, we get involved on your behalf in trying to shape the law by lobbying and influencing. A good example of this a few years back was our involvement in sorting out the mess that tenancy deposit legislation had got into. It was the CLA that suggested government use the Deregulation Act to sort this out and in short, Section 32 has partly got my name on it. More recently, of course, we have been very involved in the fight against the proposed ban on the notice only evictions under Section 21 of the Housing Act 1988. We have been lobbying for months as part of a specially formed Fair Possession Coalition that consists of 18 landlord and letting organisations uh, and we were the only one really highlighting the implications for the rural context. We all were fighting to, to try and see this off and whilst the government appeared to be listening for a while, it seems that it has just become politically irresistible to want for, for politicians to support this ban. There was an overwhelming response to this consultation which closed last October. Apparently the government are currently drowning in 20,000 responses, but nonetheless they ploughed ahead and announced in the Queen's speech back in December that there will be a renters reform bill. This in short is, is planning to remove section 21, which is the notice only route for repossession, but they plan to beef up the alternative section eight route for repossession, the one where the landlord needs to show reason. There are also promises in, in the Queen's speech that the court process will be reformed to improve recovery, which of course, as we all know, is the root of the problem here. It is not, however, something that can be fixed by another piece of housing legislation, but that's, that's another subject. There is still no date available for the presentation of this bill so we will we will fight on and of course we will get busy with amendments once it is published. I've put the link here in my notes to the response I wrote where we set out some constructive alternatives to an absolute ban on section 21. I'd love those of you who are interested to have a read of it and as many of you I know have already done do join in the effort and, and forward it to your MPs. We want to make sure that government is in no doubt about the strength of feeling on this issue and the particular implications for the rural economy that these changes pose. I've written more about this on the website and in the magazine, but that's more than enough from me. Um, we've got a full agenda, so I just want to say thank you for listening. Sorry about the technical hitches. And um, please, please don't hesitate to contact us if we can help in any way with any of this. I'm going to hand on now to my colleague Hermione, who will be speaking to you shortly. Thank you.
Okay, good morning everyone. So today I'm going to be looking at two areas of compliance for residential lettings. The new electrical safety regulations and also the minimum energy efficiency standards. So both of these are really technical areas and I only have five minutes on each of them. So I won't be able to go into a lot of detail but what I will do is I'll direct you towards three guidance notes which have a lot more information and I'll show you how to access those at the end of, at the end of my presentation. So, the new electrical safety standards. These have been in the pipeline since 2016 and came out in draft this January and actually became a statutory instrument in March, which was a surprise to many, including myself, because that was just before lockdown. So we were expecting them to be delayed. So, as, so the government haven't had a chance to publish their own guidance on this new legislation. We're expecting this in June. So the presentation today and our guidance note is our understanding of the new regulations and there are a few areas which we will clarify once the government have released their own guidance. So some key dates. This legislation comes into force on the 1st of June this year. It then applies to all new specified tenancies from the 1st of July this year. And then it applies to all existing specified tenancies from the 1st of April next year. So as you can see, it is a really tight time frame, and my colleague Alison will let you know how you can comply with these regulations amongst the restrictions of COVID-19. So firstly, let's look at what is a specified tenancy and therefore what's included in the regulations. So a specified tenancy is a tenancy for a term of less than seven years. It is as the tenant's only or main residence, and it is for a payment, a payment of rent, and that's whether market rent or not. So this will include the sort of standard residential tenancies that your properties will probably be let under, but it will also include farmhouses let under farm tenancies if they comply to these three, these parameters. So what is required under these new regs? The first and main thing is that they require at least five yearly inspection and testing. And this testing needs to be carried out by a qualified person. The remedial work identified on a report must be undertaken within 28 days. You will need to supply a report to each new tenant before the start of a tenancy and supply a report to each existing tenant within 28 days of the report being written. As a landlord, you will also need to keep a copy of this report because you will then need to give the report to the electrician at the time of the next inspection and testing. And you will also need to supply a report to the local authority if they request it, and that will need to be within seven days. So for some time, best practice has been to undertake these five yearly inspections and testings. So hopefully for a lot of you listening, these new regs won't greatly change your management, your existing management. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you want to know whether your existing reports that are less than five years will comply with these regulations. We think the intention of these regulations do mean this. Unfortunately, the wording of the legislation doesn't wholly support this. So we are waiting on clarification, either it will come as part of the government guidance or it, will become, or it will come before the government guidance. But we are calling for that clarification. And what we're advising in the meantime is to focus on properties that either don't have an electrical report or that have an electrical report which is older than five years. Once we hear anything about five years or less reports, we will of course let you know through our usual channels. Okay, so moving on to the minimum energy efficiency standards. So hopefully you are all aware of these regulations. They have now been around for some years. Um, but what I have found is there's still a bit of misinformation out there about when a property needs to meet these standards. So 
This morning, I'm just going to do a bit of a basic run through. I'm going to look at when a property legally requires an EPC. I'm going to look at when that property then needs to meet the minimum standards. And I'm also going to quickly run through what exemptions are available to these minimum standards. So start with some key dates. So the minimum energy efficiency standard regulations apply to new relevant tenancies from the 1st of April 2018 and then apply to all existing relevant tenancies from the 1st of April 2020. So the first thing that is important to look at when you're considering a property's energy efficiency is whether that property legally requires an EPC. If the property doesn't legally require an EPC, then it falls outside of the scope of MEES and it does not need to meet any minimum standards. So the, the starting point is always looking at the legal requirement for an EPC. And the main question you want to look at is, has your property been built, let or sold since the 1st of October 2008? Now, probably for um, the members listening today, the let part of that will be the most interesting. So I'll just expand on that slightly. That doesn't mean renewals or lease extensions or rent reviews. It's really only when there's been a new tenant in a property since the 1st of October 2008 that an EPC is legally required. So if you've had the same tenant in, for example, for your rent act tenancies, the, the likelihood is, is you will not need an EPC. If you do have an EPC for a property that doesn't legally require it, government guidance states that it will be treated as voluntary and you will not need to comply with any minimum requirements at the moment. So the next question to have a look at is, is your property listed or within a conservation area? Now, government guidance has said that it is not necessarily exempt if it is listed, and you will need to look at each of these properties individually. Um, the guidance note I'll point you to towards the end has the CLA's recommended approach to listed buildings, and I highly recommend you start there when considering it. And lastly, perhaps slightly less relevant, although it may be for a few of you, is if a property is detached and has a floor area of less than 50 square metres, you will not need an EPC and you will fall outside EPC legislation. So if your property does legally require an EPC, the next thing you want to look at is whether that property needs to meet the minimum energy efficiency standards, which at the moment is an EPC rating of E. So, if your property is let under one of these five tenancies, then you will need to comply with MEES. If you need to comply with MEES, like I said, you will either need an EPC rating of E, or you will need to have registered an exemption. So there is a national exemptions register. It's called the PRS, Private Rent Sector Exemptions Register, and it is a self-certified register. So you submit your application, when your application is submitted, it's live. Your local authority will get notified. They then may want to have a look at your application or they may just let it, let it stay and be valid. Um, and it's a relatively straightforward process. It's actually all set out on a guidance note. Um, so I will quickly put, there are six exemptions. And the first two on that list will be the most relevant exemptions for you. And I'll quickly talk about the first exemption. So that's all measures have been installed within three and a half thousand pounds. So three and a half thousand pounds is what we call the landlord's cap. The government doesn't currently expect a landlord to spend more than three and a half thousand pounds. And that's inclusive of VAT. And that actually includes relevant energy efficiency measures installed since the 1st of October 2017. So if you've installed anything since then and you have evidence, and that evidence is usually in the form of an invoice, but I always recommend taking photos and keeping any quotes as a record, you can count that towards that exemption. I'll quickly just talk about the second exemption. That's the cheapest measure exceeds three and a half thousand. So that is on your EPC, the list of recommended measures, the cheapest one, you have to evidence that by going out and getting three separate quotes from three separate contractors. And that is the evidence to, to, to put it um, onto, the, onto the register. So the others, again, the guidance note will give you more information on all of these, but there are six available. So that was a real whiz through 
um, some quite technical areas, but really, really important areas. So what I really recommend you doing is having a look at three guidance notes. Now, I think the easiest way to access these is sign into your account on the CLA and then make a note of those codes and type the codes in the search bar and that should bring you to the guidance note. Any questions, please do go to your regional offices and it may be that they will direct you to me and I'll end up speaking to you, um, speaking to you at some point in the future. So thank you very much. And I will now pass you over to Jessica. Good morning, I'm Jess Waddington and I lead Stratton Parker's residential research group, as well as the rural land management team in the St Albans office. The landscape of residential tenancy legislation is ever changing and it would seem as though you would, to be able to navigate it, you'd need a PhD. In this next 10 minutes, I promise to leave you prepared to deal with the challenges that this act presents and decipher the often complex jargon of residential tenancy legislation. The Tenant Fees Act came into force on the 1st of June 2019 and applies to all new tenancies from that date. On the 1st of June 2020, the provisions of this Act will apply to all existing tenancies. The risks of non-compliance are great. A £30,000 fine or, if multiple offences, a criminal record and an unlimited fine. So what can a landlord charge? They can charge the rent. This must be in equal payments or in a lump sum that is equal to the sum uh, of the total rent payments across the tenancy period. For example, you cannot take surplus rent in months one or two uh, or to be held by the landlord as a fee. A refundable tenancy deposit, so five or six weeks rent depending on the annual rent amount. We'll come back to these later in more detail as they're often the most challenging part of this act. A refundable holding deposit. The rules are so complex on this that we do often advise clients not to bother with taking one of these. You can charge for the payment for a change of tenancy, such as adding a new partner as a joint tenant or subletting. You can charge for payments for early termination when the termination is requested by the tenant. For example, the tenant wishes to end the tenancy early. You can charge the rent and all utilities up until a replacement tenant is found Essentially, the tenant charge cannot exceed the finan financial loss that a landlord has incurred. So you can charge marketing and referencing costs, and you can also charge for a reimbursement of the unexpired term of the original reletting fee. You can charge for payments for utilities, communication services, TV licenses, or council tax. The key thing is this does include internet. So if your properties are served by a private fiber line, this can be recharged but the key thing is that this has to be noted within the tenancy agreement. Utilities that are recharged, such as biomass, community gas, or electricity, which are submitted privately, must be recharged at cost, so the landlord cannot profiteer from these. And finally, a default payment for late rent payments or the loss of keys or a security device. Again, these need to be written into the tenancy agreement, and on late rent payment, no more than 3% above the Bank of England's base rate can be charged on a per day basis. I'm afraid that this act has seriously curtailed the ability of the landlord to recover costs from the tenant. For the avoidance of doubt, a landlord is, not respons is responsible for the property structure and the interior and exterior, basins, sinks, taps, and other sanitary fittings, including pipes and drains, the provision of heating and hot water, gas appliances, pipes, flues and ventilation, and electrical wiring. So what items that we currently charge would be considered prohibited under the new scheme? Inventories. Now these were previously paid for by a tenant at the commencement or termination of the tenancy, and this cost must now be met by the landlord. 
fees for the arrangement of tenancy paperwork, professional cleaning on termination. You can only require a, a tenant to clean to a professional standard and you cannot enforce that they use a professional cleaner. Credit checks and referencing. Again, a cost previously met by the tenant at the commencement of the tenancy. The cost now must be met by the landlord. Gardening services. Often, getting an unloved garden back into good condition can be a time-consuming and expensive job at the end of the tenancy, particularly if your tenants weren't very green-fingered. If you wish for gardening costs to be charged, then the landlord must take over the cost of these services, but they can be included within the rent. Or alternatively, the tenant can instruct the gardener directly, but it must be made clear that other th third parties were made available for the role rather than just the landlord's preferred choice. Chimney sweeping. Now this has caused a considerable amount of consternation and discussion among agents. Unless you've specifically noted in the tenancy agreement that the fireplace or log burner cannot be used, then the landlord is responsible for the cleaning of the flues. The legislation is ambiguous on this point. However, it's my recommendation that the cost of cleaning a chimney far justifies itself if you are found to be negligent by the courts in the event of a death or damage to the property that would not be covered by the insurance. And finally, buildings insurance premiums. Many clients we have worked with are in the regime of recharging buildings insurance premiums to tenants, and this is no longer permitted. So here's the potentially tricky bit, deposits. From the 1st of June 2019, all new tenancies are only permitted from taking five weeks rent if the property's rent, annual rent is less than £50,000 or six weeks if it exceeds £50,000. It is calculated by taking the monthly rent, multiplying this by 12 and dividing it by 52 weeks. You'll then have your weekly rent, which can be multiplied by five or six. This applies to any new tenancy, any tenancy renewals which will result in a new fixed term being granted, even to existing tenancies. In this situation, the surplus deposits must be refunded and the new deposit amount registered. Where an existing fixed term comes to an end, the agreement continues on, this, on a periodic tenancy, then the original deposit can remain the same. It is really important that you check your existing deposits to ensure that they are operating in line with the provisions of this Act. Otherwise, there could be trouble. If you want to serve a Section 21 notice or the tenant reported you, the scheme is monitored by trading standards and district councils who will investigate any claims made. As previously, there are three permitted deposit schemes in operation and you must re register deposits with one of these. Tenancy Deposit Scheme, Deposit Protection Scheme, and my deposits. You must register the deposit within 30 days of receipt and provide the tenant with the details on how and where their deposit is protected, as well as the provisions for the return of the deposit at the expiry of the agreement. When signing a new fixed term agreement, you will of course need to serve on the tenant the prescribed information, a compliant EPC, the government's how to rent booklet and a gas safety certificate, if applicable for the property. You, you are required to re-register the deposit with the, de with the deposit scheme. So in conclusion, only permitted payments can be charged from the 1st of June 2020 and all deposits must be in line with the rules. Remember that any new fixed term to an existing tenancy will result in a de surplus deposit return and the only way to avoid this is to roll existing tenancies on periodic agreements. This reduces security for both the landlord and the tenant, and this may not be desirable for both parties. If you do make a mistake and charge a prohibited payment in error, then it's not a problem. You can credit uh, your invoice within 20 days of and then there are no penalties due. Thank you for listening. And remember, if you were ever unsure, do seek advice from an agent or from the CLA. I'll now pass on to Alison Provis to discuss COVID-19 and residential markets. Thank you. Okay, good morning everybody and thank you very much for joining us today. 
So my section is just an update on the issues uh, COVID is causing residential landlords. Um, as we know, it's obviously had wide, wide ramifications um, across the whole sector um, with recent updates announced today. Um, so this is just a section on what you need to be aware of. The first uh, item I wanted to just flag up was the CLA's briefing notes and guidance notes. I know that this has been mentioned by um, Hermione, Kath and Harry already, but there is a wealth of information on the CLA website, um, which you can access by clicking on this banner on the CLA homepage. That will take you through to a COVID uh, website uh, that the CLA have created, um, where you can download briefing notes and guidance notes for members. In relation to residential lettings, the briefing notes which have been created in relation to COVID and its impact on this sector um, relate to general advice, which is the first, uh, first bullet point there, residential landlords and COVID-19. This provides um, advice to members um, on how to deal with any requests uh, for rent reductions from tenants, for example, and other matters you might like to think about. So please do check that out. That is being updated regularly uh, with government um, updates as and when those are announced. So uh, it is a, an ongoing um, process of updating that. So please do keep checking back for newer versions. Uh, the second guidance note um, Harry Flanagan has kindly created, which is um, specifically in relation to rent concession requests and contains two template side letters which landlords uh, might like to use when agreeing rent concessions with tenants. It contains two options, the first one being uh, where you've agreed a temporary rent reduction or discount with the tenant and secondly uh, if you've agreed a rent-free period or a rent holiday with the tenant. So please do check those out. So the first main change which was introduced by the um, government was uh, in relation to residential tenancies was the Coronavirus Act 2020, which was legislative intervention by the government at an early stage uh, to address the concerns of uh, worried tenants um, who might have been worried that they were unable to pay the rent um, and were facing eviction. So the Act uh, did two things. Firstly, uh, it changed the uh, notice periods landlords need to give a tenant um, from two months to three months. This at the moment is for the period from the 27th of March to the 30th of September initially. And um, that is subject to uh, extension and the Act does allow for that to be extended up to six months. The second thing the Act did was suspend all court proceedings. So uh, this applies even if you were trying to evict a tenant before the Act came into force. Um, those proceedings will be uh, halted up for, for 90 days. Um, and uh, that does mean that if you are looking to uh, evict a tenant now as a result of non-payment of rent, for example, that court proceedings uh, will be suspended. So what does the Coronavirus Act and its measures mean for you? Well, uh, ultimately, uh, you are unlikely to succeed with, evict uh, with evicting a tenant um, at present. And if you are seeking to serve a notice to quit on a tenant, either through a Section 21, which is a no-fault eviction notice, or through Section 8, which uh, allows for a variety of reasons for eviction, um, with the main one being, uh, common one being non-payment of rent, then there are two new forms to use, which can be downloaded from the government's website, uh, which ultimately reflects the three month notice period that is now required. So um, we've heard from lots of members uh, that they've had several requests from tenants for assistance with the rent. And uh, so this section is uh, mostly about practical advice, which you might like to think about uh, when being approached for, um, for help by tenants in that scenario. Um, the first point I wanted to make was really around communication. Uh, the government guidance um, on residential uh, letting sector and the impacts of COVID, um, a link to which is in our guidance notes, does encourage early communication between landlords um, and tenants to allow you to better understand the tenant situation and then provide them with the advice or support that they might need during this time. But it also does mean that you're able to plan and manage uh, your uh, business interests better perhaps. 
Uh, it's then worth taking a look at the tenancy agreements because ultimately uh, that does uh, sort of regulate what's happening between the two parties. It's unlikely that there'll be provision in there for um, a rent reduction. So any agreement you reach with the tenant would need to be uh, documented via a side letter. The parties are free to agree uh, what they like and there's more guidance on this in our uh, briefing notes. So please do check those out or contact your local uh, regional office, uh, an advisor, and would be very happy to help. Uh, thirdly, uh, justification and evidence. It's perfectly reasonable to ask your tenant to provide uh, justification for their request to you for help and associated evidence. Um, we've uh, had contact from lots of members who have been using um, uh, sort of a, a hardship form type concept where they've asked uh, tenants to um, evidence that they've exhausted all, form, all other forms of support that they might be entitled to, including any government grants, et cetera, before coming to the landlord for advice and support. Um, Carl uh, McConville from Barclays, who is coming after me, uh, will provide some more insights on that as to how uh, banks can, can perhaps help with, with cash flow in relation to that for landlords. Um, you'll then need to just consider what your own position is, uh, for example, um, what income uh, might you be losing yourself as a result of COVID, and this will help influence how you can help uh, your tenants asking for assistance. The level of rent and considering what rent reduction you may be in a position to allow, for example, this might be 50% um, for the next three months with, a, with the balance paid back by the end of the year perhaps, uh, or if they're on housing benefit, um, it might be that you reduce the rent to the level of housing benefit they receive um, so that uh, that payment can, can be made directly across to you. Finally, uh, whatever you decide and agree with the tenants, it's really important that it's documented. And this, this can be done via a side letter, templates of which uh, are in our guidance notes, and that can be then appended to the tenancy agreement. These need to be completed in duplicate and signed by all tenants uh, and any guarantors uh, that might be linked to tenancy if there is one. Uh, non-payment of rent, if regardless of any agreement you reach with the tenants or not, non-payment of rent, um, if that's an issue, uh, please do contact your regional office and speak with an advisor and we can put you in touch with our um, legal team and Harry who can help you uh, with bespoke advice in relation to that. So moving house, uh, many of you may have heard on the radio this morning or uh, read in the papers that viewings are now being permitted um, and people can move house if they follow new guidance. That new guidance is still awaited and once it's available, we will publish it uh, on our website and update our guidance notes to reflect uh, the new rules. Um, but from the papers this morning, uh, what's being suggested is that there can be a maximum of two people per, uh, per viewing uh, for a maximum of 15 minutes, what, one, five, 15 minutes, uh, wearing uh, non-surgical face masks. Prospective tenants uh, also need to declare their fit and haven't been in contact with anybody um, suffering from COVID-19 prior to uh, arriving and the landlord or existing tenants uh, need to distance themselves during the, during the viewing. Uh, I think the uh, news has also reported that estate agents, uh, removal firms and conveyances are now permitted to open as long as they comply with social distancing rules. So this would all suggest that uh, moving house and uh, reopening the uh, property sector is, is one of the government's sort of key aims at the moment and I think it's come a lot sort of sooner than some of us expected. Guidance on this is still awaited and as and when we have that uh, we will certainly update our guidance on our website so please do keep an eye on that. Finally just in relation to other considerations um, whilst Covid is, is going on there are still compliance um, that we need to address and uh, other routine maintenance so in relation to gas safety checks and electrical inspections that Hermione was referring to earlier, um, government guidance uh, on this, which um, again, there's a link to that uh, in our briefing notes, state that uh, if a landlord can show they've taken all reasonable steps to comply with their duty under, under the regulations, then they will not be in breach of, uh, of, of the regulations. So how can you show that you've taken reasonable steps to comply? Well, that would be around keeping copies of communications, uh, emails, letters, um, memorandums of uh, phone calls with tenants perhaps, 
to um, between tenants and contractors uh, when you're trying to gain access um, to do works and also having to hand the latest inspection um, in confirming that the appliance in question uh, was in a satisfactory or good condition um, last year, perhaps at last year's inspection. Urgent and routine repairs and maintenance. Uh, so with routine repairs, uh, this is we're still recommending that those are postponed where a property is occupied at present, wherever feasible. In relation to urgent repairs, um, it's all about assessing the risk and the ultimately landlords do still have a duty of care to the tenants. And where there are repairs required to the water supply, sanitation and heating systems, then this does need to be done, uh, but contractors who attend must not be symptomatic and must maintain social distancing throughout. Finally, on to MEES, which Hermione gave an update on earlier. Um, where you haven't been able to comply with these by the 1st of April, it's important that you record, make, make a note and have records as to why you haven't been able to do this. So this uh, might be a written note of a phone call with an elderly tenant who is perhaps self-isolating or shielding, um, or it might be a letter or an email from an energy assessor saying they're unable to attend um, because that they're self-isolating or something like that. It's, it's really all about demonstrating that you've taken all reasonable steps to comply with the law and um, you've documented that evidence to uh, be able to show, if, 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 if asked, that you've, you've done all you can in relation to that. So thank you very much. I hope that's been helpful. Please do ask any uh, Q&As um, in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom. And I'm now going to hand over to Carmel Conville, National Director of Landed Estates at Barclays, for insight into how the banks can help. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, appreciate that. Um, so there's really, some, there's really some good questions coming in. So I'm going to quickly cover the impact of COVID on residential lettings from a banking perspective. We've heard from the other speakers today about some of the practical considerations out there, and I'd echo these. My clients have largely actively engaged with tenants in a supportive way. They're very much ensuring that their tenants are safe and healthy, and especially elderly tenants are, are able to get, get um, access to food and groceries, etc. That's made, this active dialogue has made discussions about rent terms somewhat easier. Um, in my experience estates are generally taking a relatively firm line on rents and they're ensuring that they're not acting as their tenants bank however there will be times that it's right for both parties to make changes to agreements and as been discussed previously it's really really important that that's documented and agreed with all involved parties so looking at it from a banking perspective where there is a variation to a lease you do need to check if the property is charged to the bank as security. Do you need to let the bank know and do the bank need to agree to this change in the lease? Um, does the change to the agreement affect the value of the property and will the bank need to potentially involve a valuer? Does that change in agreement affect the security itself and will the bank need to take legal advice? Does the change to rent terms that you're proposing affect the covenants that you've agreed with the bank? and that cover your borrowing requirements. Um, you know, all of that's quite important. Some banks, I hasten not Barclays, will charge you for a consent to those changes. Um, and most banks will charge you for the advice that they have to take in relation to this. The key for me is to make sure that you contact your bank early, ascertain what the costs of this are going to be for you before agreeing anything with a tenant, and certainly before documenting it with a tenant. In relation to non-payment or delayed payment of rents. This is going to impact a state's cash flows. We're seeing it already. Um, the, the, March pay, the March rent run was largely not too badly affected across our client base. But you know, we're, we're, we're getting quite nervous about the June pay run as to see what that, what that looks like. If your cash flow is significantly impacted, you can apply for a capital repayment holiday on any loans that you have with the bank. Speak to your manager and have, have a conversation, help your cash flow. You can apply for a government supported bounce back loan. Rental income is um, you know, part of your income and therefore if it's income foregone, you are eligible to apply for a bounce back loan. You can also apply for a COVID business interruption loan, a larger loan over 50,000 um, pounds from most banks. 
um, the process is slightly longer and more protracted. But again, for those of you with larger estates, uh, a COVID business interruption loan may be, may be an opportunity. However, what I'm finding for most of my customers is speak to the bank about their existing facilities and ways of altering their existing facilities that might be short term and quite quick to implement. So such as increasing your current overdraft facility or capital repayment holiday. That seems to be the, the easiest route. But just to, put, just to reiterate, you are eligible to apply for bounce back loans and you are eligible to apply for COVID business interruption loans. Either way, the banks are particularly busy at this time and I would encourage you on both points, the variation to leases or the impact of your cash flow to speak to your bank manager in really good time and ask for that help and advice early. With that, um, I thank the CLA for putting this webinar on and we'll get to the questions and I'll hand back to Kath. Great, thanks, Carl. Um, lots of you have been typing in questions in the question and answer panel. Um, so I will now, um, we'll stop sharing the screen and ask all of the panelists to turn their video back on. Um, you'll see that some of the questions have already been answered. So hopefully the attendees can all see the answers to those questions um, that have already been answered. But um, I've got a few here that I'll ask live. So one here for Harry. Harry, when do you think the renters reform bill will come into play? Uh, very, very good question, if, if only we knew. Um, before we all went into lockdown and the government got very busy, as Alison has reminded us, drafting all sorts of new legislation, I, I would have said quite confidently that we would expect to see the bill, at least, um, this year. It, it's hard to know um, with any certainty how that timescale has been affected by current events. Um, what, I, what I would say is that there is still, it hasn't been published, only the, um, just the title. So it doesn't exist yet. Um, it may get published this year, but what we do expect is that even when it's gone through all the legislative process, and as and when it becomes an act, what the consultation originally proposed is that from that point, we would then all have six months to get used to the idea before it would impact. So that is something I can say with a degree of certainty, there will be a, a good run in while we all get our heads around it. And it, I, what I would also say is that it will apply the ban on section 21 as, as we understand things at the moment, is going to be designed to affect new tenancies after the point at which the new act comes into force. So existing ASTs, you will still have the option to use your section 21 notice. But I can advise and will be advising probably to the day I die on section 21 and all the implications. So watch this space, thank you. Great, thanks Harry. Um, we've got another one here um, on, um, in the current COVID climate, how realistic is it to try and charge for an early termination until a new tenant is identified? Um, either Alison or Jess for that one. Yep, I can go ahead. Um, I think that uh, bearing in mind that um, <clears throat> viewings are opening back up again um, and we have been marketing some properties without doing viewings, just doing uh, online videos for them um, and they've received a really good level of interest. So I would hope that um, when we are allowed to do viewings again that a property would go pretty quickly um, and therefore I would, I would encourage you, um, it, especially you, the way that you have to see it is that if you have, if you have incurred a loss by the tenant going then you're able to charge uh, the, the the outgoing tenant for that um, so yes I think you, you could charge for that. Hermione um, is there any update on the consultation of future EPC changes to B or C on commercial and has Covid pushed this out? 
So I think absolutely um, COVID has stopped a lot of government work. Um, the commercial consultation for the trajectory was released um, last year and we put in a response to that. We've not got the government's response back for that consultation. But what we are waiting on is the domestic consultation for the trajectory. And that's what we think will propose a minimum band of EPCC. That was expected before Christmas last year. So it really is running, um, running really late. Now, because of COVID, I don't think we will see it for quite a few more months. Um, they, have, they have said they have drafted it. They just haven't published it. So, um, yeah, we will, we will wait, continue to wait for that. Great, thank you. Um, another question for you, Hermione, um, regarding listed buildings and EPC ratings. Um, if your tenanted property is a listed building, and there are a great many, is there a particular exemption that covers this, or are they still covered by the criteria set out on the PRS register? Our experience is that by their nature, it is uneconomical to bring listed buildings up to an E rating, given the restrictions of the building fabric and the listing elements themselves, e.g. single glazed windows. Yeah, so this is a really good question. And what it does is it, so um, the exemption for listed buildings is actually an exemption for the requirement of that property to have an EPC. It's not an exemption to meet the minimum energy efficiency standards. So it's quite good to try and separate those two pieces of legislation. And remember that an EPC exemption for a listed building would, would be for the EPC. So um, the guidance note sets out our approach to identifying whether that listed building would be EPC exempt. And the government has actually given the ability to decide that on the building owner, which is relatively helpful or you could say it's unhelpful um, but that is for the EPC now if the property falls within the minimum standards you then and you can't bring it up to an E because I appreciate the difficulty that is especially in a rural setting you will then have to rely on a MEES exemption and those are the six exemptions that I listed on the slideshow but in terms of the the exemption because of its heritage status that's an EPC exemption and I, I highly recommend reading the guidance note and then I'd be happy to, to help you further on an individual basis. Thanks Marnie. Um, question here for Alison. If a Section 21 notice served before, it is a Section 21 notice served before lockdown still valid and if so for how long? i.e. is the six month validity extended or not? And could a tenant at risk health status mean they're entitled to remain in the property for longer? So any Section 21 notice served before uh, the uh, Act came into force, uh, it is still valid, but your possession proceedings will be suspended. So you, uh, it, it basically just, just sort of sit there um, and uh, the court won't, won't act on it. It, 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 it won't be taken forward. Um, in relation to how long that would be valid. Um, Alison, your sound has gone a bit strange. Um, do you want to just try muting and unmute? Is that any better? Uh, no, I'm not sure. But um, perhaps um, if there's any questions, then we can, um, it, we can get someone to contact you following the, the session today. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, the, a comment here um, from someone, we've spent £3,500 on several properties which still do not meet E-level. However, this has enabled us to get the exemptions. Um, yeah, something that um, a lot of our um, members have experienced. Um, so there's a question here related to, um, to COVID again. So what is the position with regards to um, council tax and utility bills on properties where two months notice was given in January and February, where we've been unable to market. Um, 
Alison, do you want to try and turn your, your mic on again and see if that works? Yeah, is that, is that any better? Um, no, it isn't actually. So I think we'll, we'll move on to another one. Um, who is authorised to carry out an EPC assessment? Um, either Jeff. Yeah, I can jump in. So um, you, they need to be registered. So they need to be a registered EPC assessor. And on there is a national database which you can access, which has all the registered EPC assessors on there. So that's how you can find an EPC assessor if you don't have one. What I would say is it's really helpful having a good EPC assessor, especially if you have traditional buildings that are rural. Um, so if you can ask your local lettings agency or a neighbouring land lord that you know if they know someone good i would recommend doing that but otherwise they have to be assessed and they're then part of this database thanks Miney. um a question here for jess does the tenant charges include farm tenancies and residential long leases it includes uh, short shorthold tenancies and licenses. So farm tenancies are excluded from the tenant charges. So I think someone asked whether they would still be able to uh, uh, recharge insurance premiums um, for farm buildings, and that is absolutely fine. Um, for residential long leases, I would say that in, if they are a long lease that's granted uh, for a term of more than seven years, then um, I think that you would be exempt from that. Um, but I think a, a, agreements that have gone rolling um, and then have become seven years, um, you, you would still uh, be responsible. You, 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 the tenant charges would still apply for that. Great, I think we'll um, ask one more question, um, either Hermione or Harry. If the obligation is to supply an electrical safety certificate to an existing tenant within 28 days of it being produced, should the tenant be supplied with the initial unsatisfactory certificate, the subsequent satisfactory certificate after the remedial work is completed, or both? Um, it's a very good question. I must say Hermione and I have spent many hours trying to get our heads around the enormous requirement to serve copies. Um, I would just say on this that a lot of the questions I'm seeing coming up on electrical safety, um, I hope will be answered by the guidance note that was published yesterday. So I really encourage those of you interested to have a look at that. Um, the, where there's a current tenant, they need to be served as and when a new um, inspection report is is produced. Um, if they've been in there for a while, they will already have had one given to them before they went in, if, if one were available. So in, in a sense, they will be updated. Yeah. Miley, did you want to add to that? And there's a lot, there's an awful lot of paper um, that is going to be required <laughs> to be produced to tenants and local authorities in, in sort of rotation. We, I saw a question just on that um, in the chat about can it be done by email. Our understanding at the moment is if in the tenancy agreement um, tenants have agreed to receive service of notices etc by email then that might be acceptable but that again is one of those areas where I, I very much hope the answer will be yes but we, we will have to wait for the government guidance to spell that out for us. Thanks Harry. And thanks to all of our panellists today. Um, just so that um, it, it, they, we've had lots and lots of um, questions come up on the Q&A panel. Um, some of them have been answered already by the panellists. Um, if you have any outstanding questions, please, please get in touch with your regional office. They might well put you in touch with Hermione or Harry. There's lots of information on the guidance notes on the CLA website, so please do use that. We're here to help you. Um, thanks for joining us and for taking part today. Um, if, like I said, if there's anything else you'd like to discuss, please get in contact with regional office. Um, also do look out for details of our up and coming webinars. 
On Friday, we have the next of our In Conversation With series. Um, we have Henry Dimbleby speaking um, Friday at four o'clock. That should be very interesting. If you can't make it for the live session, that will be available on the website afterwards as well. A reminder that today's session has been recorded and will be available on the CLA website seminar pages um, either later today or tomorrow. If there are any other topics you would like to hear about in future webinars, then please do get in touch. Thank you very much.